at this snail. Yeah, he's holding up all those bugs. And they're in such a hurry. Well, they're really getting upset. Yes, they are. Well, we've got something to make them feel better. You have? What? Herbert's song. Who's Herbert? Oh, this is Herbert. A, a snail. snail. A very wise snail. There was a snail called Herbert who was so very slow. He caused a lot of traffic jams wherever he would go. The ants were always getting mad and the beetles they would chew. But Herb would only poke along and sing this little tune. Have patience, have patience, don't be in such a hurry. When you get impatient, you only start to worry. Remember, remember, that God is patient too. And think of all the times when others have to was much younger, he often got in trouble. Forgetting that he was a snail, he did things on the double. He crashed through every spider web, and with crickets he collided. Herbert's father took his feeding son aside. Have patience, have patience. Don't be in such a hurry. When you get impatient, you only start to worry. Remember, remember that God is patient of all the times when others have to wait for you. Have patience, have patience, don't be in such a hurry. When you get impatient, you only start... Now, I'm preaching this message on patience because I have struggled with patience my whole life. Yeah, patience is not something that, that has come easy to me. And since I was a small child, this song has been sung to me and has gone through my head my whole life. So whenever I start to he get impatient, I will hum this song. I can remember for my 12th birthday, I had lots of things, but the thing that I remember the most about my 12th birthday is I opened a box from my mom, and inside of it was a little metal snail. He's about this big, and he sits in my room to this day to remind me every day about being patient. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about several areas of our lives that God wants you to focus on having patience. So how many of you occasionally find yourself being impatient? Yeah, amazing. The sad thing is the number one group of people we're generally impatient with our family and close friends, those ones that we love the most are generally the ones that we're normally most impatient with. See, it's more natural, I think, we've discovered to be impatient. Anger, revenge, those things come more naturally than setting those things aside and being the bigger person. There's something supernatural, even better, to transform your relationships with being patient. It's better than getting up upset at that friend that's always late, or the boss that's really annoying, or the child that's chosen to walk away from God, or someone who you constantly see makes unwise choices. It's even better than pleading with God to hurry up and answer the prayer that you've been praying over for all of five minutes. So our Bible verse today, I'm hoping will change your thought process on impatience. And it said, 
Proverbs 16, 32. Better a patient man than a warrior, a man who controls his temper than one who takes a city. So say it with me. Better a patient man than a warrior, a man who controls his temper than one who takes the city. Proverbs 16, 32. Hmm. Better to be patient. Better to be patient than arguing and being argumentative with people. Better a patient man than a warrior, a man who controls his temper than one who takes a city. So how many of you had your patience tested like in the last month? Some of you are like, I'm, I'm pretty patient. It doesn't happen like all the time. Well, I, I know I have, and, and we talked about family, right? So Wednesdays around my life is a pretty crazy day. We get up, we get to church. I teach Wednesdays, uh, Wednesday worship class. If you're available at 10 o'clock, come join us. It's a great series we're doing, Choices That Determine Destiny. It relates to everybody. So don't just say, well, I don't know. Come. If you've got time, come join us. It's an hour and 15 minutes out of your week. I promise. And there's pastries and, you know, coffee too. So come hang out with us. But so I get here. I prep for that. I teach. Then I try and wrap up things that need doing. And then Thomas has golf for 90 minutes in the afternoon that I have to take him to. And then by the time that finishes, because I go to that end of town, and I live on that end of town, so I finish up, get him home. I have about 12 minutes from the time I walk in the door to scarf down dinner, to turn around, to put Savannah in the car, to be late to get to swim team. I then sit there for two hours while she's in swim team. And so by now, I'm just kind of, my day, I'd like to be done with my day, right? But no, 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 my day is not done because my child gets out of the pool and puts away her swim equipment and then putzes around the deck to go get her swim bag to then visit or I don't know what else and then get to the locker room. Now, once we get to the locker room, this isn't, in my estimation, it's hurry up, let's go. I, I have been nice all day long and I am now done with being nice. I would like you to shower as fast as humanly possible Put your clothes on and get in the car so we can go home and I can pray with you, kiss you goodnight, and I can finally breathe. <laughs> no, my child seems to think this is the time that we should visit with all of our friends. And that for some reason, we can't figure out how to shampoo, rinse, condition, rinse, soap body. We have to, like, drop it on the floor and we have to go to the other end of the shower room and talk to my friend. And... <laughs> She knows if I've come in there a second time, even her friends to this point are like, um, Savannah, you better, yeah, you gotta go. You got like, you gotta hurry this up. And I'm like, I get it. I'm like, so I do. I lose my patience occasionally with my wonderful children who I love. But some days I just reach the end and just, I can't take it any longer. I just need my day to be done. Maybe there's somebody in your life that's testing your patience. You wonder, why don't they recognize that this thing that they do bugs me? Or why doesn't my boss realize how amazing I am at my job? Why won't that person just apologize? You know, I, they screwed up. I've been the bigger person here and not mentioned it, but they really should apologize. Or the thought might go through your head, why do I put up with this? I just, I don't need this. Why do I put up with it? Well, let me remind you of our verse for the week. Proverbs 16, 32. Better a patient man than a warrior, a man who controls his temper, than one who takes a city. Now, Paul wrote in the New Testament something very similar. Because sometimes you go, well, the Old Testament, that doesn't like really apply. That was written a really long time ago. Well, Paul had this to say in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 13 through 15. Live in peace with each other. We urge you, brothers, warn those who are idle. Encourage the timid, help the weak, there you go, be patient with everyone. There wasn't like a, the person that bugs, or my boss that doesn't, or my kids that are always, or my friend that's always, no, 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 there is no asterisk next to this. God just had Paul write, everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always be kind to each other and to everyone else. So it's not only just the people that you like, it's the person that's annoying you when they aren't, you know, the light is green and they haven't gone. 
Or the person who's in the 20 lane checkout with 37 items. So why is patience better? That's what I'm here to answer today. So if you'll take out your bulletins, the first fill in the blank in your notes today, it says a patient person can help heal a broken relationship. Proverbs 15, 18 says this, a hot-tempered man stirs up dissension, but a patient man calms a quarrel. So we're going to hop back into the Old Testament here, and I've got a story to tell you. The story takes place in Genesis, so you know it was a really long time ago. This story is about a guy named Joseph. Now, Joseph was the youngest son of the time, and he had ten older brothers. Which, if you've got any older siblings, you know how that feels. Most of you probably don't have ten. You might have one or two, and it's still really hard. But so Joseph was here, and Joseph, you know, being the youngest, everybody was like, you're going to do whatever we tell you to do. Because there's ten of us above you, and we're all bigger than you. So here we go. Joseph is this young man. And Joseph, one day, has a dream. And he is so excited about his dream. He gets up, and he goes, and he finds all of his brothers, and he gets them together, and he says, guess what? I had this dream. And the dream is, you're all going to bow down to me. <laughs> and I am pretty sure that every one of those ten older brothers looked down and went, say what? Um, no, 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 you, you misunderstand here. You're the little brother. You, you're you going to bow down to us. We're in charge. You're going to do what we say. There is no way that we're bowing down to you. And Joseph's like, God told me that's what, this is what's going to happen. So this kind of irked his brothers. So they get together and they start thinking, we need to teach this Joseph kid a lesson. So they're out one day and they come up with this brilliant idea. We're going to throw Joseph into a dry well. That'll teach him. So they take and they shove him into a well. Except for one or two of the brothers are kind of like, well, we can't like leave him there to die. Like, I'll have a guilty conscience. So we, we got we to gotta come up with something else. So while they're standing there hemming and hawing, like, what do you think? I don't know. What do you think? A slavery caravan is coming by. So one of the brothers goes, I got it. We're going to sell him. So they hoist him up and they sell Joseph. And they take back the sob story of the ripped cloak and tell their dad, oh, boo-hoo, we're so sorry you got eaten by a wild animal. We didn't do anything about that, of course. But, we, yeah, he got eaten by a wild animal. So you've got Joseph who's now on a caravan and who's leaving his home country and gets taken all the way to Egypt. Joseph shows up there and Joseph gets sold to a guy named Potiphar. Now, Potiphar was the chief soldier in all of Pharaoh's army. So there's like a hierarchy here in slavery, as, as if you didn't know that or whatever. You got like the, you know, the really low guys like that, like clean, like the pot that you do bad things in and you don't want to touch. And then you got like the important people who like get to look pretty and get to be around the family and things. Well, Joseph worked and was blessed and Joseph got to be a high level. He was actually so intelligent that he was put in charge of Potiphar's entire house. He was in charge of the money. He was in charge of other servants. He was like all of that. Now, Joseph was a good-looking young guy. The Bible tells us that. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't, you know, homely, and he didn't have, like, big scars all over or whatever. He was a good-looking guy. And Potiphar's wife one day decided that she thought he was a really good-looking guy and that, you know, that she would like to sleep with him. And Joseph went, um, no way. Um, I respect my master. You're his. He's given me charge of everything else, but you're his. Well, this made her upset because, you know, it's always that one thing you can't have. So she goes, and she starts screaming, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. And everybody comes, and Potiphar believes his wife, and he has Joseph thrown in jail for something the kid didn't do. So now you're going, okay, how does, how does this work? First, the kid is thrown in a pit because his brothers don't like him. And then we get him thrown, he's a slave. And now the kid's thrown in jail. But lo and behold, Joseph goes to jail. And he doesn't know what he's doing there. But he rises up and the guards put him in charge of other prisoners. And he gets 
a, a ranking among the guards, and, and he gets to be in charge of things. And pretty soon, two guys from the king's palace gets thrown in. One's the cupbearer, and one is the chief baker. And they both have a dream. Joseph interprets these dreams, because they don't know what it means. And he goes, well, good news for one of you is, in three days, Pharaoh's going to call for you, and you're going to go back, and he's going to let you have your job back. Bad news for you is three days, Pharaoh's going to call for you, but he's going to chop off your head. So, but, hey, guy here, when you go back, will you remember me and tell, the king, you know, tell Pharaoh, I'm stuck here and there's no reason for it? Well, he doesn't remember because he got his job back and he's living in the palace again and everything's good. All of a sudden, though, what happens is that Pharaoh has a dream and nobody can tell him. And then the cupbearer goes, oh. Pharaoh, I remember there's this guy in jail, and he does dream interpretations. So Pharaoh goes and gets him, and he brings him, and he goes, what does it mean? And Joseph says, well, I can tell you, you got these seven fat cows, and that means seven years of good, and then you're going to have seven skinny cows, that's seven years of bad. Okay, so you are so smart, he gets put in charge of everything. He, you, you're going to come up with a plan, Joseph. You're so smart. So once again, he rises up. He becomes second in command of all of Egypt. And lo and behold, the time comes when there's this huge famine, and nobody's got food. But Joseph had made a plan and stored up all this food. So pretty soon, people from other countries start coming to Egypt. And one day, ten brothers walk through the door. Except for they don't know that the guy that they're about to stand in front of is the guy that they sold into slavery. Because not in their wildest imagination could they ever believe that the little brother that annoyed them so much could be second in command of Egypt. So we come to this point in the story where these ten brothers are standing before the little brother, the runt of the group here. And Joseph knows who they are, and they have no clue who he is. And Joseph has a choice at that moment. Joseph can choose to behead them, to throw them in jail, or to just simply say, get out, we're not dealing with you. Joseph doesn't do any of those things. Joseph goes on to say, it's me, your brother, and I've been put here for such a time as this to help my family. And I'd love to have been a fly on the wall when those brothers looked and went, oh, my word, what did he do? And look where he's at. Joseph could have let those years of anger and frustration by the fact that his brothers who were supposed to take, you know, family's supposed to stick together and threw him in a pit and then sold him. And he could have held anger and animosity and the second they walked in the door, he could have said, off with their heads. But he doesn't. Because patience can help heal a broken relationship. So I have permission to, get, to tell you this next story here because it's my mother-in-law, Sharon. And I called her yesterday and I said, uh, you're my perfect example. And I want permission to share this. Sharon had a sister named Sandy. And Sandy has a daughter. And when Sandy's daughter was about 16 years old, Sharon gets a call from her sister to say she's pregnant. And I'm taking her to get an abortion. And I want you to tell me it's okay. Well, the daughter didn't want to have the abortion, and Sharon said she shouldn't have the abortion if she's not. And her sister said, you don't support me, and hung up the phone. Sharon's sister didn't speak to her for years. Didn't call, wouldn't see her. And the only thing Sharon could do was get on her knees and pray, God, you heal this. I've done everything I can but you heal this. And years went by. And one day, Sharon was sitting there, and the phone rang. And Sharon answers it, and it's her sister, Sandy. Sister Sandy's in the hospital and has just been diagnosed with colon cancer. And she asked, would her sister come see her? So before Sandy went home, a relationship was restored. Because Sharon had patience to say, God, you work. I can't do it, but you can. 
Proverbs 25, 15 says, through patience, a ruler can be persuaded. Through patience, God can change hearts and heal relationships. The second thing in your notes is a patient person gives God time to work. Psalms 27, 14 says, wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. See, Joseph didn't give up. Not when he was sold into slavery. Not when he was a slave. Not when he was accused of something he never did. Not when he was sent to jail. Not before he's pulled before Pharaoh to figure out what this means. The coolest thing is, is when you read these passages, it's about 13 chapters in Genesis. It takes place over about 93 years. But as you read these, each time before something really bad happens, Scripture records, for the Lord was with him. The Lord was with Joseph when he was thrown in that pit. And the Lord was with Joseph when he was sold into slavery. And the Lord was with Joseph when he was sent to jail. See, most of us, as soon as the hard times hit, we decide God forgot us. He's left us on our own to figure out our problems. We don't have the patience to wait for God's timing. So we go out and we try and fix it ourselves. And I was trying to come up with a good example, and Aaron and I were bouncing ideas off of each other, and all of a sudden he said, what about me? You want an example of patience and God's time, what about me? And I said, you're right. I don't know a better example than Pastor Aaron. See, Pastor Aaron was 33 years old before God answered the prayer that he'd been praying. God, give me a wife. See, patience for Pastor Aaron meant he had to say no to a lot of good things. He had to say no to opportunities that were presented to him. He wanted me to make sure that you knew that he was highly sought after in the dating market. And so saying no took some effort. It meant a lot of lonely, sad nights where he would sit there and say, God, did you forget? I'm still here. I'm still waiting. And Aaron will tell you, he made some bad relationship choices. And he had to make decisions to quickly listen to God's voice to say, this isn't it. Just keep waiting. I've got it. But this isn't it. See, Aaron kept waiting and trusting God that he was going to answer his prayers. I'm grateful every day that he waited and he didn't let God's timing be trumped by his own impatience. The building you're sitting in today is all because of patience. We knew about two years before our lease expired in the other building that we weren't going to be staying. And we went looking. I would guess we probably looked at 40 properties at least. The pastor would hear of one going on the market or something that could work. And it always came down to me. Pastor would go, I think we can make it work. And I'd say, no, it's not it. Well, what about this? I can see we could make it work, but I'm telling you, it's not it. So the running joke was when we finally came to look at this building, I got a call on a Wednesday afternoon, and the pastor just simply said, I need you to meet me at this address. Okay, well, I've got the kids, I'm at, the, I'm at church, so I don't know where you're at, but text me an address and I'm bringing them with because I can't, like, abandon them here. So I put them in the car and we pull up to this building and I'm like, what are we doing here? He's like, well, I'm going to go in and ask the pastor if we can walk around because I saw there's a for sale sign they put up yesterday. Okay, pastor, we're, we're here. So the pastor said, sure, come on and take a look. So we walked through the building and we looked and... You know, we finished and thanked the pastor and went back to the office. 
And, you know, Pastor Danny came in, and he's like, so? And he's like, I know you think that there's things wrong and that we did. It's not this and that. And I said, yes, it's time to go. The patience it took to get here was amazing. And the patience to know that God would provide, because there were several times that we didn't know if we would come up with the money. And we didn't know if we could come to an agreement on price. And it took prayer and patience to say, God, if it's you, it'll happen in your time. Not in my time, because my time would have been two years ago. But your time, God, I'll wait. Because I love this verse, Romans 8, 25. But if we hope for what we do not yet have, and we wait for it, Patiently. It's okay to want something else. But it's waiting in God's timing for it to show up is what we have to learn to do. Because better a patient man than a warrior, a man who controls his temper, than one who takes the city. We could have forcibly taken another building and rolled the dice to say, is God going to bless it or not? But we waited till God brought us exactly what he wanted us to have. And the last one in your notes. Be patient because God is patient with you. <laughs> I think we sometimes forget that part. 2 Peter 3 verse 8 and 9 says, But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord a day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years is like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. I heard this great, great quote this week by another pastor. God isn't early, but he's never late. God isn't early, but I promise you, he's never late. So you may feel that God's slow to answer your needs. Can you imagine being Joseph for a minute? And saying, God, I'm in a pit. Okay, then my brothers pulled me out. They're, they're, all right, God, so thank you for getting me out. Except for, wait a second, now I'm a slave? Okay, God, I, I have no clue, but I'll go. I'll, I'll be the best slave. I'll do what it is you're asking me to do. And God gave him favor, and he was raised to the highest status. And then all of a sudden, Joseph gets accused of something he didn't do, and he gets thrown in jail. Not for like a few hours or a few days. He gets thrown in jail for something he didn't do. And then he thinks, oh, God, Pharaoh's guys, they'll remember me when they go. And he gets left and forgotten again. God, are you really there? Are you sure you didn't forget that I'm here? See, some of you are sitting in that situation today and you're saying, God, I, I've been praying. I prayed like three times this week about this situation and I really need you to get on it. But I think sometimes the reality of the situation is that God's saying, I'm waiting for you to really turn to me. Not for you just to, to, to do our, our Hail Mary prayer. God, it's really bad right now. I guess I need your help. I mean, I know I was doing it myself and I should have let you do it, but I screwed up, so fix it. I think sometimes we get caught up in that and we forget that God wants all of us, not just the three-second part. That constant communication that we've talked about, if you were really doing that and you were really with him and following him, he'd know you and you'd know him. And you'd know he hasn't forgotten. And he'd know that he's got a perfect plan and perfect timing. See, we're naturally impatient. But what God wants to do is a supernatural work to draw you into a relationship 
with him, where you fully trust his timing and his will. Both those are two pieces of the puzzle. Some of you may be sitting here today saying, hey, Pastor Trudy, I've, I've gone down the wrong path. Guess what? God's waiting patiently for you to turn around and say, God, I need you. When we have patience, we give God time to act, to move the pieces where they need to go. To bring the right pieces into our lives. Because sometimes the what you need, you're not ready for yet today. Who you need in your life has got to work on some things in their life before they can be ready to be a part of your life. The job, the house, the car, whatever it is, God hasn't forgotten. He's just got perfect timing. Sometimes we feel like he, he left, he didn't leave. Better a patient man than a warrior. Better someone who waits on God's time than forces their own plans. Because that's when we have to go back and get it undone to move forward. Better patience than trying to control what God's plan is. So I want to take a minute and pray. And I want to pray today that you'd allow God to speak to you. That you'd allow your life to be transformed. And add some patience. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to ask, if you have a relationship that needs to be healed, will you raise your hand? So Father God, you see these hands. And we're going to wait patiently on you to begin to work in these circumstances. But we're marking today is the day that we asked God begin to work. God begin to heal. I don't know every situation, but God, you do. And you know your, their hearts. And you know their desires. So God, we're telling you today, we'll wait. If it's a week, a month, a year, five years, ten years, God, your timing is perfect. And we're going to wait patiently. And God, we're going to need some help to do that. We're going to need a supernatural touch because our human heart is impatient. And we want it now. But for relationships that need healing, that you begin to start today. I'm going to ask right now, if you need God to work in a situation, it's not a relationship, but you've got an issue and you need God you'd raise your hand and say, God, I need you in my situation today. God, I need you. Father God, you see every hand raised here today. You know every situation. I don't have to know them. But I stand in agreement with them that you begin to work. That you begin to help them steer away when they get off course. Like Pastor Aaron who kept waiting. And he might have stumbled a few times, but you helped him get back on course to say, I'm here, just have a little more patience. I promise I'll work it out. That we would look around and we would be encouraged by those around us who've gotten their answers. That we would know that you continue to work in us and for us, God. Though I pray that our timing is always we want it now, but that we gain patience with our family, with our friends, with the things that bug us and irk us, God, give us patience that we wait on you. Well, I want to 
to take a moment right now and remind you that tonight is the last training if you want to partner with us for Hope 253. It'll be tonight at 6 o'clock at Life Center. We are looking for people who can show up tonight for training and again on August 13th, 14th, 14th, 13th the men event, men's event, uh, 14th at Cheney Stadium. Um, it's going to be a free concert. We've got Israel Houghton coming. We've got Jordan Feliz coming. We've got Tyler Lockett coming to speak. Invite a friend. Grab a neighbor. It's going to be a fun night. But we're looking for some people who would step up and say, hey, I, I want to be more than just invite a friend. I want to help. Some areas that you can help serve in are to come tonight and be trained on, there's going to be a salvation message at the end. And we're needing some people to show up on the field to pray with people who have made that decision. The decision that you've already made and understand what it means. To then, you're going to get their contact information and we're asking you to follow up with them during the week. Invite them here to your home church. If they don't live close we're going to help you connect them to another local church. Because we don't want them just to take that first step and feel like they're lost out there by themselves. We want to invite them in to the best family that they could ever know. We also need people who want to say, hey, I don't know if I want to do that, but we need people to enter in information. And we're going to write postcards that are going to get sent out on Monday morning to say, we're thinking of you. This step you made is a big deal. So that's our follow-up team, connecting, helping connect people with their next steps. So if you'd be interested in doing those things, we need people, if you want to say, hey, I don't want to do that, but I could come pray. We're going to have two different prayer rooms going the entire night. Because when we get this many people together, I guarantee you Satan's going to be working overtime to say, you don't really want to go down there. You don't really want to make a life change. So we want to bind that and say, God, your spirit, your will be done. You begin life-transforming moments for these people. So if you can come out tonight, um, you've got to come out tonight for the training. It'll be about an hour and a half. There, uh, you'll meet in the Sanctuary at Life Center. There's going to be worship for a few minutes, a message, a 10-minute encouraging message on why we're doing this. And then we'll be broken down into all of the different teams. Pastor Aaron and I will be there tonight. So if you come and go, I don't know what team I should serve on, where I should go, we'll be there to help you figure out uh, where we can help plug you in. Um, so get there tonight because they'll give you all the directions. You've got to get your name on the list so that when we go and they give out badges and stuff, that your name's on the list and they can say, yes, you're supposed to be here. So please come out tonight. This isn't just a Life Center thing. There's 50 churches that are partnering together to pull this event off. Um, you know, we had, I think, 9,000 people last year. They're hoping for more. Um, they had four or 500 salvations last year. We're hoping for more. So come partner with us um, as we're reaching our community in different ways, stepping outside of these four walls. So before you go today, I want to bless you. So Father God, I pray right now that you protect every person in here. May you smile on them. May you be gracious to them as they go from this place. God, may you show your favor and give them peace till they come back to this place. 